welcome welcome to well i would say winchester baptist church this is winchester baptist church today um it is in fairham so welcome to fairham uh, it seems a bit weird saying welcome to winchester baptist church when no one is at church but for the time being this is church so yeah um wherever you're watching whether you're still in bed i won't tell anyone or whether you're having your breakfast, you might be in the garden, you are so welcome here and it's great to see you all. So this is a few verses from Romans 15. Uh, we who are strong ought to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. Each of us should please our neighbours for their good to build them up. May the God who gives endurance and encouragement give you the same attitude of mind toward each other that Christ Jesus had. So that one, with one mind and one voice, you may glorify the God of, and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Accept one another then, just as Christ accepted you, in order to bring praise to God. And then the verse, uh, the verse, fin no, the chapter, sorry, finishes with, May the God of hope fill you with joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Good morning Winchester Baptist Church and others who are joining us this morning. I've got my mug here with some rooibos tea in it but it's probably a good mug for praying because it's great expectations and I think we can come to God with great expectations because he is an almighty God. In my devotions this morning I was reading Genesis 3 verse 8 and they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. I like to think this was a regular activity before the fall. I assume God walked with Adam and Eve and talked with them. Jesus' death and resurrection restored the link between us and God. He wants to walk and talk with us now. And that's prayer. At the end of the day, Catherine and I sometimes walk around our garden discussing what's in it and other matters. And our prayers can be like this. I believe our Father God longs to just spend time with us, chatting. We can tell him our cares and ask him to intervene in issues. But our movements are currently restricted. If you have a garden, you can get into it. But if you're on your own and you can't get out and you don't have a garden, know this, that God still walks with you. God still wants to be with you where you are and it's why Jesus came and died for us. Covid-19 is certainly an important topic for our prayers this morning and we will be praying for those who are involved on the front line fighting it. But it's also good to remember those for whom the coronavirus is diverting attention away from their needs. We should pray for those needing treatment for other conditions or waiting for a breakthrough in research to help them. So let's bring our prayers to God. Lord, our lives have been disrupted by this virus. Forgive us, Lord, for failing to see the needs of others, particularly in developing countries. We think of the 4,000 people each day who die of tuberculosis, and there's many others. Open our eyes and our hearts to the needs of others, Lord. Give strength, protection and wisdom to those fighting the coronavirus. To the health workers, those constructing hospitals, our politicians and the many people helping in their communities. Help us to see what we can do to be salt and light in this situation, in our homes and our neighbourhoods. Lord God, as we look to you, take away our fears. May we find comfort in you. And may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, Guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. So a big warm welcome, like Eleanor said, to Winchester Baptist Church. Um, it is different, but church is where one or two people gather in Jesus name. And that's what we are doing. We may not be all physically in the same location, but we are gathering as one family. So this morning, I've got something to show you. I've brought 
my pet with me. So my, I've got my pet in here and I love to show him to you. He's really well behaved and I bet you'd like to see him. Should I get him out? I'm just gonna get my pet out right now. Oh, he's, he's a little bit shy, so I have to be quiet. Let's get my pet out. Oh, my hand only just, oh, ow. Just getting my pet out. Let's get him out. Here is my pet. He is a pet rock. I've got a feeling that some of you are not really appreciating my pet. But let me tell you something. In 1975, a man named Gary Dahl was talking to his friends and they were all complaining about their pets, how they had to walk them and clean them out and pay their vet bills. And Gary joked that a rock would make a perfect pet. A few months later, he started selling pet rocks. Now you may think that pet rocks are a little bit silly, but actually he sold so many rocks that he became a millionaire. That's a lot of pets, isn't it? It's a lot of different pet rocks that he got. Now, I do like my pet rock, but you can't really play with them. You can't, they don't roll over. They don't fetch a stick. They're not nice to cuddle up to. And um, they don't really make any noise. They don't talk to you. They don't bark. Well, I tell you, there was one time in history when the rocks almost could have shouted out and sang out. And that was on Palm Sunday. And that's the Sunday that we remember today. The day that Jesus came into Jerusalem riding on a donkey. The day when Jesus came near a place where the road goes down to the Mount of Olives. There the whole crowd of disciples decided to shout to God with joy in loud voices. They praised him for all the miracles they had seen. They shouted, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. May there be peace and glory in the highest heaven. Some of my Pharisee, some of the Pharisees in the crowd spoke to Jesus. Teacher, they said, tell your disciples to stop. I tell you, he replied, if they kept quiet, the stones would cry out. Wow, it almost makes me wish that the crowd had stopped so we could have heard the, the rock sing. But what might those rocks have said? Maybe how a little shepherd boy named David used small stones to slay a giant, showing us that we can do anything because God is with us. Or how the prophet Elijah used stones to build an altar to God. Or how Solomon used stones to build a beautiful temple so people could worship God. Or how Jesus told a story about a wise man who built his house upon the rock. And when the storm came, the house on the rock stood firm. I would, I would hate for my pet rock to start praising God because I wasn't willing to. How about you? Wouldn't you rather sing praises to Jesus than count on the rocks to do it? Now, hopefully you got yourself a rock. If you didn't get one, don't worry. You can grab a piece of paper and draw the outline of a rock onto it. So we're going to spend a little bit of time decorating our rock. Now you can draw whatever you want on your rock. The only thing you have to have on it is the word praise. Because today is all about us praising God. So grab your rocks, grab whatever you have to decorate them. And while you're decorating them, you can praise God. You might want to shout praises out loud in your living room, in your bedroom, in your garden, wherever you are. Or you might just want to say them quietly in your heart. But now just spend a few moments and we're going to spend a few moments decorating our rocks and praising God because he is the king of kings.
Oh Lord, we praise you that you are the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And Lord, no matter what our circumstances, we praise you. We praise you for the sunshine, for the flowers, for the bees, for the hedgehogs in the garden, for the deers, um, for the friends that we have, for the conversations we have. We praise you, God, because you are creator of all. Well, I hope you've had some um, great time praising your rocks. Here's the one that I've just quickly quickly done now i've got a nice rainbow and the word praise um we'd really love to see your what rock your rocks so um please do post pictures of them on our group um and i'd love to see them and it'd be really great now you can put your rock somewhere where it will remind you to praise god especially when we're in lockdown it's a bit tough sometimes it's hard um to want to praise so you may want to do that or maybe when you head out on your daily walk, you may want to leave it somewhere so someone else can find it and can bring a little bit of joy um, into their lives. So let's pray together. God, we thank you that the rocks don't need to cry out on our behalf. We praise you for filling our hearts with joy and causing us to sing and shout your praises. Even in these uncertain times, let our hearts sing your praise. Amen. So before Marcus comes and speaks to us this morning, let's read God's word together. So if you've got a Bible, um, grab it. We're going to be reading from Matthew chapter 21 and starting at verse 1. So that's Matthew chapter 21, starting at verse 1. Um, I'm reading from the New International Readers version. Um, so yours might be a little bit different, but follow as best you can. As they approached Jerusalem, they came to Bethphage. It was on the Mount of Olives. Jesus sent out two disciples. He said to them, go to the village ahead of you. As soon as you get there, you will find a donkey tied up. Her colt will be with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, Say that the Lord needs them. The owner will send them right away. This took place so what the Lord has spoken through the prophet would come true. It says, Say to the city of Zion, See your king comes to you. He is gentle and riding on a donkey. He is riding on a donkey's colt. The disciples went and did what Jesus told him to do. They brought back the donkey and the colt. They placed their coats on them for Jesus to sit on. A very large crowd spread their coats on the road. Others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. Some of the people went ahead of him and some followed. They shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred up. The people asked, who is this? The crowds answered, this is Jesus. He's the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. Jesus entered the temple courtyard. He began to drive out all those who were buying and selling there. He turned over the tables of the people who were exchanging money. He turned over the benches of those who were selling doves. He said to them, It is written that the Lord said, My house will be called a house where people can pray, but you are making it a den of robbers. Blind people and those who were disabled came to Jesus in the temple. There he healed them. The chief priests and the teachers of the law saw the wonderful things he did. They also saw the children in the temple courtyard shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. But when they saw this, they all became angry. Do you hear what these children are saying? They asked him. Yes, replied Jesus. Haven't you read about it in scripture? It says... Lord, you have made sure that the children and infants praise you. Then Jesus left the people, went out of the city to Bethany. He sent them, spent the night there. 
So that's our, that, that is our Bible reading for today. And now over to Marcus, he will bring us our word. Welcome to all of you. Today's Palm Sunday. Yeah, Palm Sunday, Palm Crosses. Uh, we're looking at the events of Palm Sunday where Jesus rides into Jerusalem on a donkey and the cult of a donkey. Um, and he fulfills a prophecy from Zechariah many years ago that was spoken. And as he rides in to Jerusalem, he spent three years ministering around the neighbourhoods and the, the areas surrounding Jerusalem. And on more than one occasion, uh, Jesus has silenced the religious authorities and he's made them look powerless and self-obsessed. He's ruffled the feathers of religious powers. And now in our reading, he makes his way into Jerusalem for the final time, an occupied city. And as he does so, ordinary people flock to greet him as he makes his entrance. His entry into Jerusalem brings about celebrations, people lining the road as he comes in and they shed their clothing to throw before him and they shouted, Hosanna, Hosanna. Now, Hosanna, which is the Greek version of a Hebrew word, the Hebrew word is Hoshiana. And that's related to an Aramaic word, Ashana, which means save, rescue or saviour. Therefore, whilst the crowds are, they're not rioting, they're not scuffling with authorities, they are declaring their allegiance to Jesus in a very political way. Help us, save us, we pray, saviour. Now, if what they meant by their cries was save us from our sins, save us from ourselves, our selfish ways, that would fit perfectly with what Jesus goes on to do. However, and I'm not wishing to be rude about the people who were lining the road those days, I would probably have said and done the same things as they did. Um, I don't think they truly grasped what Jesus was going on to do as he rode into Jerusalem. After all, his disciples who'd been with him for the three years of his ministry didn't have a clue until much later what Jesus was going to accomplish. But just because the people may not have understood what their cries and their shouting truly meant, doesn't mean that the religious authorities of the day wouldn't have felt the pinch of their critique, their shouts of Hosanna, Jesus once again ruffling their feathers. So the crowd shout, help us, save us, we pray. And then they add something onto the end of that. Help us, save us, we pray, saviour, son of David. That last part of the phrase brings this into both a religious and political arena. The Jewish nation were longing for another political and religious king in the footsteps of their famous king, David. One whom they hoped would restore Israel as a political kingdom. So these shouts would create political ripples Although I doubt very much that the Roman Empire felt threatened by Jesus at this point. An itinerant preacher with no power base on earth other than this ragtag bunch of disciples and followers, he was hardly coming up on their radar as a threat to their status quo. But once again, this information in the right hands could prove valuable as we see later in Holy Week when the religious authorities use such knowledge to twist the arm of the political authorities. But let's not allow a good religious political story to get in the way of a great parade. People are lining the streets, they're shouting their praises and hopes at Jesus. And as they do so, many in their crowds take off their outer garments, their big coats, as we call them up north. If it gets too cold, it's time to put your big coat on. So they take off their big coats. Was it hot? Probably. But that's not the point. To take off their outer garments and lay them on the road before Jesus was highly symbolic. There are various instances in, in history where that's happened. Uh, I quote one of them on the online sermon. So if you want a bit more detail, have a look at the online sermon. Um, but the stripping off of such garments, these outer garments, can be connected with stripping off what is associated with security. Outer garments were often given as a deposit, securing a loan or other such promise. If you go back into the Old Testament in Exodus chapter 22, verse 26, it says, if you take your neighbour's cloak as a pledge, return it by sunset. If your neighbour wanted to borrow something off you, tools, food, money, they would often leave their outer garment with you as a deposit to say, I'm going to come back and make amends, I'm going to make payment for what I've borrowed, or I'm going to bring what I've borrowed back. Because actually this outer garment is really precious. It's what kept them safe and warm at the night and in the cold weather. And again, Jesus picks up on that in his teaching in Matthew chapter 5, verse 40. He says, if someone wants to sue you and take your tunic, which would be the lighter clothing you wear under the big coat, if they want to take your tunic, give them your big coat as well. 
give them your cloak also. For the crowd to take off their outer garments and lay them down for Jesus to process over could be seen as laying down their deposits of trust in him. Furthermore, they're stripping off their security before Jesus, making themselves vulnerable to him and to his cause. The processional crowds were opening up to Jesus, becoming more vulnerable before him, offering their outer garments as deposits, but in exchange for what? Were their shouts political revolution? Possibly. Were they placing their deposit of trust in Jesus to overthrow the Roman Empire? Again, possibly they were. If so, then maybe when they went on to see that Jesus is a non-violent revolutionary and had no intention of toppling the Roman Empire by brute force, let alone chasing them out of the capital Jerusalem, we shouldn't be surprised that they then turned their voices of praise and adulation into cries of crucify some days later, as their misplaced hopes were dashed. After arriving in Jerusalem to the adoration of the crowds, Jesus goes in and he takes a trip to the temple. What could possibly go wrong with that, you might ask? The Son of God going to the very place that was built for the worship of his heavenly Father. Well, as Jesus walks into the outer courts of the temple, and the outer courts were the only place where Gentiles could go and pray and worship. As he goes, the outer courts are filled with livestock who are on sale, with money changers offering good rates to change Roman coin into temple coin. And all of that was done for a profit, of course. This place of prayer and worship looks more like the stock exchange or a local livestock market. A place of worship and prayer for all nations has become a place of profit and retail. If the religious authorities were still not awake to the dangers inherent to their religious monopoly in the face of Jesus' arrival, here is where Jesus finally pokes a sleeping bear. Jesus turns the tables over, casts money off the tables, chases the traders out of the temple courts. And as he does so, he states quite clearly what the purpose of those courts was for, was for prayer and for worship for all nations. As he quotes Isaiah chapter 56 and then Jeremiah chapter 7, which condemns the use of the temple for such things. So, Jesus has got the backing of the crowds as he enters Jerusalem. He's poked both the sleeping bear of commerce and profit as well as poking the bear of religious authority and power. And as if that weren't enough trouble to stir up, Jesus stays on in the temple courts, opens the eyes of the blind, looses the limbs that have been bound for too long and heals people. He's woken the twin bears of political and religious power and a reckoning is sure to follow. My working message or title for the sermon, and you'll see it on the online version, has been Parades and Poking Bears. Parades is self-explanatory. It's, it's Palm Sunday. Jesus goes in and it's a great parade with people shouting. But underneath the celebratory tone is danger and foreboding. The origin of that phrase, um, to poke the bear, comes from the imagery of what would happen literally if someone poked a bear. I mean, imagine... Bears are a topic that often come up in our house or whenever they're on nature programs. I don't like bears. I'm terrified of them. I've never seen one in life. Don't mind if I... Well, I've never seen one in the wild. I've seen them in a zoo when I was little. Um, but I just... People think they're cuddly and lovely and I just think they're not. They're ferocious. And they'll tear you apart if they get the chance, if they're hungry. Imagine you come across a sleeping bear. If you walk past it, if you back away from it and walk away without disturbing it, you're fine, you're safe. Now imagine you come across that sleeping bear and you walk up to it and you give it a good prod. You're in trouble. You've started some trouble. And what I think we learn from Jesus here is that some bears need poking. Not to cause trouble, but to free people from the bondage of such sleeping bears. Those metaphorical bears in the life of Jesus, religious and political power, held people in chains and kept them in bondage to a corrupt system. So Jesus, being the physical embodiment of truth and justice, walks right up to them both and prods them with all of his divine might. As followers of Jesus, we too must, stay, must make a stand against unjust regimes, be they religious, political or otherwise. 
Over the past weeks, with the turmoil of the coronavirus, several burrs have been revealed, or rather, they've come into the spotlight. They've always been there, and we probably know that they've always been there. But the current crisis has brought them into sharper focus. Some of those I'm, that have come to me this past week, I'm going to share, there will be others. Um, and perhaps I'm getting too political. You can feedback, let me know. The way in which so-called non-skilled workers of last month are now some of the key people we rely upon. Delivery drivers, shelf stackers, supermarket checkout assistants and workers in all supermarkets, cleaners, waste disposal, and the list goes on. And yet the wages they get paid are disproportionate to the need they serve, especially in times like this. NHS, emergency staff, social services, all the, the plethora of frontline workers who again for many years have endured pay freezes and budget cuts because of austerity, whilst other sectors get pay rises and bonuses. All of a sudden we realise it's not the financial sector that will care for us when we fall ill. It's not the hedge fund management team that will mop our brow or intubate us when we're sick. And in the past few days, another bear has been highlighted. The football clubs that are now seeking a bailout from the government. And sad to say, even my own football club that I support, Liverpool, have come into this spotlight. As they put workers on furlough and as they're seeking money from the government to pay those workers, whilst they still pay their players an extortionate amount of money who aren't even playing games at this time. There are many more such sleeping bears in this world that need poking and confronting. And you may have in your own mind some of your own that have come to you, unjust regimes or issues or causes. The big question is when this crisis is over, because during this crisis, during this crisis, it is about caring for one another, looking out for the vulnerable and the most in need. But after this crisis, what will we as followers of Jesus do about the things that have been revealed as unjust and unfair? To conclude, um, I'm just going to see if I can pick up on any of these comments. There's a few more good mornings. Uh, Gina says, what do you do if a black bear comes at you? Oh, well, again, you see, this is the conversation we have in our house about these bears. Um, I've got to go and get it right. Brown, lie down, black, fight back. There you go. That's what you do with those bears. That's a rough guide. If it's a polar bear, it doesn't really matter. If it's close enough to you, you're not going to get away. Anyway, coming back to the conclusion of the sermon, four things I want to mention. Uh, the first, what needs stripping off in our lives? What do we need to let go of in the light of Jesus? And where are we placing our security? Do we need to strip something off and lay it in front of Jesus and say, Jesus is first? Secondly, perhaps the crowds were half right. They'd stripped off and they got themselves ready for action. They made themselves vulnerable to Jesus. They praised him. But then maybe at the last minute they clung to the old ways instead of seeking a new way. We know what that's like. We get comfortable, even with ways that aren't right. They seem comfortable to us. Where are we clinging on to old ways that need putting to rest? As, as a society, as individuals, even as a church. And thirdly, what things do we do as a local church that have maybe become routine to us, but hinder others in coming to worship God? like the traders in the outer courts of the temple. What, has, what have we become blind to that stops other people coming to know God? And finally, number four, where do we see injustice and corruption? And what will we do about it? I want to pray for each of you listening to this, that you'll be kept safe through this crisis, that your faith in the God who loves you will grow, and that together we can make this world a better place for those who follow us as we follow in the footsteps of him who rode into Jerusalem to confront sin and injustice and give his life for others. Amen.